Chapter one. I walked down to the beach and waited for Mally, but she didn't show up. The moon was full and the ocean breeze felt warm. Two hours I sat there on the sand, no Mally. In the beginning, it was just annoying, but after a while, I began to worry that something was wrong. My cousin, in spite of her issues, is a punctual person. I kept calling her cell phone, but it went straight to voicemail, which was Mally chortling in a British accent. I'm in the loo. Ring you back later. I didn't leave a message, and I didn't text either, in case somebody else had her phone. Somebody like her dad, who's my uncle. He takes away Mally's cell like twice a week as punishment for acting up, acting out, whatever. Still, even when she's in trouble at home, she always finds a way to sneak out to the beach. A few turtle people were scouting the shoreline, waggling their flashlights. I walked north as Mally and I usually did. We never, we'd never seen a turtle actually laying her eggs, but we'd found several nests. The first thing you notice is the flipper tracks leading up from the water's edge. Loggerheads, hawksbills, and green turtles leave trenches like mini dune buggies when they drag their heavy shells across the sand. After the mother turtle finishes depositing her eggs, she covers them with a loose, churned mound. Every time that Mally and I come across one, we'd call the state wildlife office and they would send an officer to market. First, wooden stakes are tapped into the sand to create a rectangular perimeter outside the mound. And then hot pink ribbons are strung from one stake to the next. You can go to jail for messing with a turtle nest. So the officers put up a warning sign. Still, every so often, some random idiot gets caught stealing the eggs, which are sold as a romantic ingredient in certain places. Pathetic, but true. The phone chirped, but it wasn't a text from Mally. It was my mom asking where the heck I was. I texted her that I was still down by the water and that no savage criminals had tried to snatch me. Afterwards, I tried Mally's number once more and she didn't pick up. So I walked on alone until I came to a marked nest that I didn't remember seeing the last time Mally and I were there. The dig was new and soft, and I picked a spot outside the warning ribbon and sat down holding my baseball bat, which mom makes me carry for protection whenever I go to the beach after dark. It's an Easton aluminum model left over, left over from when I played Little League. I feel dorky carrying it, but mom won't let me out of the house if I don't. There's too many creeps in this world, she says. The slanted moonlight made the waves look like curls of pink gold, and I lay back, folded my arms behind my head, and closed my eyes. The wind was easing, and I heard the train blow its horn to the west on the mainland. That wasn't all. I heard the sound of breathing, too, and it wasn't my own. And at first I thought, turtle. The breaths were damp and shallow, like air being forced through a broken, broken whistle. I sat up, and I looked around. There were no sign of tracks. Maybe it was an old bobcat watching me from the dunes. Or a raccoon. They like to dig up the loggerhead nests and chow down on the eggs. I slapped the Easton in my palm of my left hand, which stung. The noise was sharp enough to scare off most critters, but it didn't frighten whatever was breathing nearby. Leaving seemed like a smart idea, but I got only 50 yards before I went and turned back. Whatever I had heard couldn't be very large because otherwise I would have spotted it. There was really no place to hide in an empty beach at, under a full moon. Approaching the turtle nest, I put down the Easton and I cut my ears to, the, to muffle the sound of the waves. The mysterious breathing seemed to be coming from inside the rectangle of pink ribbons. Could it be a crab? I wondered. A crab with asthma? Because the turtle eggs don't make a peep. That I knew for a fact. Carefully, I stepped over the border of ribbons and I crouched on top of the nest. In and out went the raspy noise, slow and even. I leaned closer and I saw a striped soda straw sticking out of the sand. Through the exposed end, I could feel a puff of air whenever the underground creature exhaled. No more than three inches of the straw was exposed, but that was enough to pinch between my fingers. And when I pulled it out of the mound, the in and out noise stopped. I stood dead still, still on my heels, waiting for a reaction. Honestly, I wasn't trying to suffocate the critter. I just wanted to make it crawl out so I could see what the heck it was. My thought was to take a picture with my phone and then text it to Mally, the world's sneakiest crab, right? But then, as I was peering at the spot where the soda straw had been, the turtle nest basically exploded. A full-grown man shot upright in a spray of sand, and my heart must have stopped beating for 10 seconds. Built like a grizzly, he was coughing and swearing and spitting through a long, caked beard. And it, on his chiseled block of head, he wore, and I swear, a flowered plastic shower cap. 
Even weirder, his left eye and right eye were pointed in totally different directions. I vaulted back over the ribbon and snatched up my baseball bat. He said, get serious, boy. After catching my breath, I asked, what are, what are you doing here? Gagging, thanks to you. I tried to apologize, but I couldn't put the words together. I was too freaked. Let's have your name, the man said. Uh, Richard. Do they call you Rick? No. Ricky? Richie? Just Richard. Outstanding, he said. I like your parents already. Dude, you can't sleep in a turtle nest. Well, what'd you do with my straw? And he brushed himself off. I'm guessing he stood six foot four, six foot five, large, like I said, and he wore a moldy old army jacket and camo pants, and he was clutching a dirty duffel bag. They'll put you in jail, I said. Oh, yeah? He wheeled in a full circle, kicking violently at the sand with his boots, and I covered my eyes. You see here, Richard, he said when he was done, it's not a real turtle nest. One by one, he yanked up the stakes and then tied them together with pink ribbons. He crammed the whole bundle into his duffel and said, I was waiting on a man. While you're buried on the beach? It's meant to be a surprise. His name is Dodge Olney. Tur digs up turtle eggs and then sells them on the black market for two bucks a pop. One night, he's going to dig me up. Well, then what, I asked. He and I are going to have a chat. Why don't you just call the law? Olney's been arrested three times for robbing loggerhead nests, the man explained. The jailhouse experience has failed to rehabilitate him. I'll be taking a different approach. There was no anger in his voice, but the slow way he said the words made me seriously glad not to be Mr. Olney. So tell me this, Richard, what are you doing out here? I don't have much experience with homeless persons, so I was sort of sketched out. But he was an old dude, probably the same age as my grandpa, and I decided there was no way he could catch me if I ran. Looking up and down the shore, I saw that I was on my own. The nearest flashlight beams were a couple hundred yards away. More turtle people. There was a row of private houses on the other side of the dunes, and so I figured I could take off in that direction if necessary, pound on somebody's door and yell for help. I got to get going, I said to the stranger. That's an excellent idea. If you see a girl out here my, about my age, that's my cousin. I wanted him to know in case he got any crazy ideas. He was aware that in the moonlight, I had a good look at his face, those weird eyeballs that didn't match. You want me to have her call you, he asked. Don't talk to her, please. She'll get scared. Well, that's understandable. Maybe you should find somewhere else to crash, I said. He grinned, and I mean, these were the whitest, brightest, straightest teeth I've ever seen. Not what you would expect on an old grungy guy who would just popped out of a hole in the sand. Son, I've walked the whole way from Lauderdale on this hunt, sleeping every night on the beach. That's 130 odd miles and you're the first person to make it an issue. It's not an issue, I said. Just, you know, a suggestion. Well, I got one for you. Go home. What's your name? I asked. So you can give it to the cops? Yeah, no thanks. I promised not to call the police, which was true for the moment. The man wasn't breaking any laws, sleeping underground with a straw for a breathing tube. Really, he wasn't bothering a soul. And then I came along and riled him up. The name's Clint Tyree, he told me, although I haven't answered to that in years. Good night now. He walked away along the water's edge. I sat down beside the remains of his fake turtle nest, took out my cell phone, and Googled his name that he'd given me, just to make sure he wasn't listed on some sort of child predator site. He wasn't. He was, however, famous for something else. When I caught up with him half a mile down the beach, I told him that his Wikipedia page said he was dead. Wiki who? He said. It's a community encyclopedia on the internet. You might as well be talking to me in Martian. And he kept walking, the waves splashing over his boots. I said, dude, I really want to hear your story. Well, first, tell me about your cousin. You're worried about her? Not really. Yeah, that's bull. Okay, I said, maybe a little bit worried. She was supposed to meet me here tonight, but she never came, which is weird. You tried calling her? Sure, over and over. The man nodded. Hold my eye, he said, and plucked the left one out of his face. I was home in bed when Mally finally texted me. Grounded again, sorry I couldn't sneak away. A perfectly believable excuse, except for one hitch. After leaving the beach, I jogged the seven blocks to her house and seen that the lights in her bedroom were turned off. Mally was a total night owl. She always stayed up way past midnight. It was only 10.30 when I'd crouched behind the oak tree in her front yard, watching her window. The room had been completely dark, which meant that Mally wasn't home, which meant she couldn't be grounded. And from my bed, I texted back, are you okay? Fine, call you tomorrow, she replied. 
Of course, I couldn't sleep after that, so I went out to the living room where Trent was watching television, a cage fighting match on pay-per-view. I'm being serious. Your mom's snoring like a buffalo, he said. They snore too? I thought they just snorted. Hey champ, before you sit down, grab me a cold one from the fridge. Trent drinks more Mountain Dew than any mortal human on the planet. It's hard to watch because he slurps the stuff so fast and it drips off his chin like green drool. We're talking gallons of sugary caffeine every day. I brought him a bottle anyway. Trent is my stepfather and we're cool. He treats me like a kid brother and I treat him the same. He's harmless and good natured and dumb as a box of rocks. Is that ice cream? He asked me. No, Trent. It's a cheese ball with chocolate sauce, I thought. Uh, you want some, I asked. Maybe later, champ. You believe these two beasts? Trent was addicted to cage fights. You see that? That's real blood, he said. Wow. That was the best I could do. The truth is, I would rather sit through a documentary on Calvin Coolidge than watch these two buzz-cut goons beating the crap out of each other in a supersized dog kennel. Mom married Trent last December, not quite three years after my father passed away. Dad was an awesome guy, and I miss him worse than anything. He was way smarter than Trent, but he died in a really stupid way, and he would be the first to admit it. So here's what happened. He drank two beers, hopped onto his skateboard, and crashed full speed into the rear end of a parked UPS delivery truck. It was a large vehicle, but my father didn't see it in time. That's because he was too busy unwrapping a Butterfingers candy bar while he coasted down the A1A. No helmet, naturally. We're talking about a 45-year-old man with a master's degree in engineering from Georgia Tech. It's truly unbelievable. At the funeral, one of his surfer buddies stood up and said, at least Randy died doing something he truly loved. What, I thought, bleeding from his eardrums? Afterwards, mom was a wreck, and she pretty much stayed that way until she met Trent, whose only known hobby is golf. He works as a real estate agent here in Loggerhead Beach, but business is slow, so he's got an unhealthy amount of spare time. His second favorite TV program is a cable reality show called The Bigfoot Diaries. To yank Trent's chain, I told him I spotted a skunk ape on the beach. Get out, he said. Well, he smelled like a skunk ape. Just wait, champ. Someday they'll catch one of those hairy monsters, and I can't wait to see the look on your face. Trent is a true believer in Bigfoots, Sasquatches, skunk apes, which is what they're called in Florida. The one I met had a glass eye, I said matter-of-factly. I dusted the sand off of it for him. That's real hilarious, Richard. And he tipped the liter of Mountain Dew to his lips and chugged the backwash. I heard they're going to start hunting them like drones, you know, like they do in the t with the Taliban. How cool is that? Ultra cool, I said, and then went back to bed. I fell asleep listening to Willie Nelson, one of Dad's favorites. And when I woke up in the morning, there was a text from a girl named Beth, Mally's best friend on the track team. She's gone, Beth said with an exclamation point. Gone where? I texted back. She won't say. What do we do? Chapter two. My uncle looked surprised to see me. He had on his work clothes. His name's Dan, and he runs a bucket truck for Florida Power and Light. Is Mally around? I asked. No, Richard. She left yesterday. Left for where? School. She didn't tell you? Well, I thought her classes didn't start for a couple of weeks. Come on in, Uncle Dan said. I just got home from work. Hurricane season, he works as a night shift because the pay is better, and he's got seniority. You want some breakfast? Sandy's still asleep. He poured me a bowl of cornflakes, and on top he sliced a banana that was so old and mushy that honestly, a starving chimpanzee probably wouldn't have touched it. Yeah, Mally flew up for early orientation, he said. I just nodded while I chewed on my cereal, avoiding the funky brown slices. She forgot all about it, Uncle Dan said, until two days ago when her dorm advisor called. You know, but that's Mally. Yep, classic, I said. Uncle Dan and Aunt Sandy were spending were sending Mally to an all-girls boarding school called the Twig Academy. Basically, they didn't want to deal with her on a daily basis anymore. She's a handful, no question. Mally had told me that the tuition at Twig is 30... 39 grand a year, not including the meal plan. Add the cost of winter clothes plus airplane tickets back and forth to New Hampshire, and who knows how her parents plan to pay for that kind of education. Mally suspected they were taking a second mortgage on their house, meaning they must have been semi-desperate. It's weird she didn't tell you she was leaving, Uncle Dan remarked. So you guys could didn't even say goodbye? Oh, it's no big deal, I said, which was a total lie. Mally and I were born only nine days apart. 
Except for vacations, both of us have spent our whole lives in Loggerhead. I couldn't picture her at a boarding school in a place so cold that car engines froze. Truthfully, I couldn't picture her at a boarding school, period. Mally wearing a uniform to class? No way. Did she talk much to you about this move to Twig? Uncle Dan asked. Because we got the impression she was sort of looking forward to it. I think all of us need a break. Um, she seemed okay with it, I said, which was actually true. Mally had been incredibly calm and low-key when she told me the news. Where, if it had been me who was getting shipped off to some snotty private academy, I would have been highly pissed off. New Hampshire? Seriously? Still, I wasn't ready to swallow Mally's early orientation story. To Uncle Dan, I said, mm, she borrowed a book from me. Do you mind if I go get it? Of course not, Richard. He was attempting to make waffles with a digital waffle maker that my mother had bought for him for his birthday. Programming the thing was complicated enough to keep him distracted while I snooped through Mally's room. Her one direction poster was still on the wall. So were Bruno Mars and the Jimi Hendrix, Hendrix experience. Mally was into all kinds of music. The closet wasn't as empty as I thought it would be. And right away, I noticed that she hadn't taken her winter clothes to school. There was a heavy parka that had a hood lined with fake rabbit fur and a red fleece with the L.L. Bean price tag still attached. Okay, it was only August. Maybe she planned to come home for a visit and then to get her coat and fleece before the weather up north got cold. Or maybe Sandy was going to pack up everything and send it to her. Or maybe Mally hadn't actually flown to New Hampshire. Her laptop was gone and her desk was cleaned out, except for one drawer. Inside was a white envelope that had the initials TC printed on the front above an address in Orlando. TC was a guy named Talbo Chalk, who was older than Mally. He lived near Disney World and supposedly was some hot club DJ. Mally had never met him in person, but she'd made friends with him online, which was beyond stupid in my opinion. I told her so. That ex I told her that exactly, at least more than once. Even though the envelope wasn't addressed to me, I opened it. A note in Mally's handwriting said, Talbo, please don't forget about me when I'm away at Twit's boring school. Try to land a gig in Manchester so we can finally get together. Included with the note was a wallet-sized photo. It was her class picture from last year before she got her braces removed. A picture she didn't like and one she would never have given to a guy she was trying to impress. Mally always kept some cute selfies on her iPhone. She could easily have texted one to Talbo Chalk. She could have texted him a note too. But the envelope wasn't really meant for TC. And Mally hadn't simply forgotten to mail it. She'd left it inside her desk on purpose for her parents to find. I put it back in her drawer. As soon as I got home, I googled the street address in Orlando, which turned out to be a motel near SeaWorld. I called the place and, big shock, nobody named Talbo Chuck was registered there. Next, I took a, looked up the Twig Academy and dialed the academic office. When does or early orientation start for the new students? I asked the lady who answered the phone. We don't do early orientation, she said. And I called Beth right away to tell her. She wasn't surprised. Her conversation with Mally that morning had lasted barely two minutes. She swore me to secrecy, Beth said, but she didn't tell me enough to even call it a secret. Well, what about Talbo Chalk? All she said was, don't worry, girlfriend. He's a man of the world. Yeah, well, so was Jack the Ripper. I'm scared too, Beth admitted. Well, let me see what I can find out. The stranger who'd buried himself on the beach wasn't just a regular homeless person, if there is such a thing. A long, long time ago, he'd been the governor of Florida, as in the governor. According to Wikipedia, Clinton Tyree was a college football star before going to Vietnam and winning a bunch of Army combat medals. After the war, some friends talked him into running for governor, even though he didn't like politics. He campaigned on a promise to clean up all the corruption in Tallahassee which was our state capital, and apparently he tried hard. Frustration set in, and then sadness, depression, and even, some said, insanity. Then one day, half re halfway through his term of office, Clint Tyree flat out disappeared from the governor's mansion. Nobody kidnapped the man, he just bolted. The politicians who'd been fighting against him said it proved that he was crazy, but his supporters said that maybe it proved just the opposite. All kinds of wild rumors got started, and some of them turned out to be true. According to one Wikipedia entry, the ex-governor became a wandering hermit of the wilderness, and over the years, he'd been a prime suspect in several acts of eco-terrorism. Interestingly, 
He'd never been arrested or charged with any serious crimes. And it seemed to me that the targets of his anger were total scumbags anyway. The web article included interviews with a few witnesses who'd supposedly encountered Clinton, Clinton Tyree by chance. They said he'd lost an eye and was going by the name Skink. They had differing opinions about whether or not he was nuts. The most recent entry quoted the governor's closest friend, a retired highway patrol trooper named Jim Tile, who said, Clint passed away last year in the big cypress swamp after a coral snake bit him on the nose. I dug the grave myself. Now please let him rest in peace. Except the man was still alive. I found him only a mile or so up the beach from where he'd been the night before. He'd constructed another fake nest, though he hadn't yet concealed himself beneath the sand. He was kneeling outside the pink ribbons, calmly skinning a rabbit. Roadkill, he explained when he caught me staring. There's a deli on the corner of Graham Street. I can get you a sub. Oh, I'm good, Richard. The shower cap was arranged on his head in the manner of a French beret. In the light of the day, I could see the color was baby blue. You didn't walk very far today, I said. Nope. How come? Well, maybe I'm feeling too old and broken down. He was old, but he looked solid and tough as nails as Trent liked to say about the cage fighters on TV. They had your picture on the internet, I said, from like 40 years ago. No doubt I've aged poorly. Well, even without the beard, I could totally tell it's you. It, it was some beard too. The night before in the moonlight, it had kind of looked distinguished, like Dumbledore's. Now I could see how ungroomed and patchy it really was. To the twisted tendrils, Skink had attached what appeared to be broken seashells until you got a closer look. Are those what I think they are? I asked him. Bird beaks. Okay, that's not funny. From turkey vultures, Richard. Well, but why? Eh, they're kindred spirits, he said to me. In the sunlight, I saw that his good eye was a deep forest green and that the artificial one, the one that I'd cleaned for him, was brown and shaped differently than the other. Well, what's the latest with your cousin, he asked. It's not good. I think she's run off with some dude she met online. Meaning, on the computer? He's much older than her, I said. How much older? Old enough to drive, obviously. Hmm, that's unsettling. And Skink, Skink wrapped the rabbit meat in a rag. The fur he carried up to the dunes and tossed into some sea grape leaf trees. Afterwards, he asked me what I planned to do about Mally. I guess I'm going to tell her parents. Today, I texted her and called a bunch of times, but she's not answering. Is that like her? Eh, sometimes, I said. He sat down a few feet away, and I told him how Mally had lied about going to early orientation. The note she left was totally bogus to fake out her mom and dad. Well, tell me the name of her new boyfriend, Richard. Talbo Chalk. And I spelled it for him, though it was just a guess on my part. I'll make a call, he said. Do you want to borrow my phone? Skink smiled. Nah, thanks, but I've got my own. All incoming calls are blocked except for one. Hey, why did your friend, Mr. Tile, tell the reporter you were dead? Because I asked him to. Come back in an hour or so. So while the governor made his private call, I walked to a surf shop on Kirk Street. My father used to hang out there, so the owners know me. Dad bought all of his boards there, and so do my brothers. Before going off to college, they used to surf every day. There's no beach in Gainesville, so now they're, so now they're surfing. I'm not a surfer, but I like board shorts and flip-flops, and that's basically my official summer uniform. I was looking through a rack of new Volcom shirts when my phone made a high moaning noise, which actually freaks people out until I tell them my ringtone is a humpback whale. I walked outside to answer the call. Sup, Richard? It was Mally. Where are you? Don't be all mad or I'm hanging up. I said I wasn't mad, just bummed. Sorry about the beach last night, she said. I forgot about this orientation thing. I must have blocked it out of my mind. Mom's totally pissed, but she's got me on the late flight out of Orlando. It was like, you know, last seat on the whole plane. What luck, I said dryly. But I still almost didn't make it to the airport security. I found a bottle of... Oh, but I still almost didn't make it because airport security found a bottle of vitamin water in my backpack. Seriously, one of the TSA guys pulled me out of line and made me dump everything out. Vitamin water? I had to laugh. Mally was on a roll. What's so funny, Richard? Vitamin water is the bomb. Whatever. Why'd you text me that you were grounded at home? I tried to keep my voice low because I was standing on the sidewalk in front of the surf shop. Customers going in and out of the door beside me. Well, I couldn't call you at the time, my cousin said, and I didn't want you to be mad that I left without saying goodbye. 
So now you're really up in New Hampshire. Yeah, in this place, it's the armpit of all armpits, Richard. And very calmly, I said, Mally, there's no such thing as early orientation at the Twig Academy. I called and checked. What? <laughs> you did not. You're so busted, I said. Tell me exactly where you really are. And she hung up. Not exactly an earth-shattering surprise. Mally is legendary for hanging up on people. Usually, she calls back in five minutes. Ten max. But this time, she didn't. A text popped up as I was heading to the beach. If you go to my parents, I'll never speak to you again. Knock it off, I texted back. I'll tell your mom what happened in St. Augustine. Swear to God, Richard, you would never. Don't push me, my cousin text me back. text back. And suddenly I felt sick. Not barfy sick, just sick at heart. The governor was collecting crabs when I returned to the beach. I told him that I'd finally heard from Mally and that everything was fine. He said, no, son, it's not. And then he to told me something that made me feel even sicker. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry, guys. This book is like every chapter ends like that. I promise 